Good morning. Our Bible reads today are from Isaiah 44 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Isaiah 44 is on page 591 of the Church Bibles. And if you would like one, just raise your hand and someone will bring one to you. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 to 8. But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. Still others will write on their hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's on page 981. Verse 4. Hmm. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the... Yes. Oh, that's why it doesn't make sense. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 4. Okay. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thanks, Naomi. I'm David, the pastor here. Welcome to church. It is a joy to bring God's word to you each week and let me pray for you and for us, and for me, as we listen to it. Father, as we come to your word, and as we um, hear it expounded, Father, we pray that your spirit would work in us that which is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Who here likes group photos? You like group photos? I love group photos. Um, the thing about a group photo, here's a group photo of us. There it is. 
a group photo of our church about a year ago. And um, the thing about a group photo is it's very different from seeing a portrait, isn't it? When you're looking at a portrait of yourself, it's all about you and it's all about your, you know, how you look and your appearance and all that. But in the group photo, it's not just about you. It's about your relationship to the rest of the group, isn't it? It's about how you fit in. It's about your place in the group. What do you do with that group? What's the purpose of that group? Um, you know, you're looking for yourself, aren't you? And you're thinking, my part in this group is that I do this. You're thinking about your place within the group. You know, if you're looking at um, a family photo, you look at it and you think, gee, I'm a big brother. You look at a a, a photo of your soccer team and you think, I'm the goalie. You look at a school photo of when you went to school and you think, I was the class clown, right? You think of yourself in relationship to the rest of the group, don't you? Now, today's passage in 1 Peter is a bit like looking at yourself in a group photo. It's about where you fit in God's people in the church. Now, remember, 1 Peter is written to fellow followers of Jesus who are far from home. They're foreigners, they're strangers. And in our passage today, Peter is going to show us three group photos of us. And each photo is going to show us how we're different, how we're foreigners, how we're different to the rest of the world. Each image has something to tell us. Um, each image is going to teach us about our place, our practice and our purpose. Okay, our, that's, what to listen, that's what to listen for today, our, our place, our practice, and our purpose. So the first image, let's look at the first image here. It's an image of our place, and our place is a heavenly dwelling. Have a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones... Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. The, the first image here is this. It's an image of stones. Okay, we're a bunch of rocks. But we're not just stones. We are living stones. All right, we're alive. Why are we alive? We're alive because Jesus is the living stone. We get our life from him. Do you see that in verse 4? Come to him. That's Jesus, a living stone. He's the living stone. He's the living stone who gives us our life because he was the one who was raised from the dead and he gives us resurrected life. Of course, we're living stones. We can't be dead stones. And what the master builder is doing is he's cementing us together cementing us into a spiritual house, a place where God dwells. You know, once upon a time, God had an address on earth, and his address was P.O. Box, the temple. The temple, that was the place where God lived in Jerusalem. It was a place where you could go to meet with God and to uh, be with him. But what we're told here is that the place where God chooses to make his home is the church. Wow, that's us. God actually, the God of the universe chooses to make his home, to make his dwelling place in us, the church, Wenty Anglican Church. Wow, we must be so special. We are a heavenly dwelling. We are a colony of heaven. We are an outpost of glory. Can you believe that? Look around. Just look around for a minute. Wow, God is, God is living amongst us, in us, the temple. And do you see the main structural feature of this building? It's in verse 6. It's the cornerstone. The cornerstone. Uh, Jesus is the foundational stone. That's what the cornerstone is, the foundational stone. He, he's the head of the corner. The cornerstone was the stone that gave the building its stability. Every other stone was built around 
the cornerstone. It gave the building its shape, it gave it its design, it gave it its structure, its stability. And perhaps Peter here is remembering the occasion where, you know, Jesus looked at him and said to him, Peter, I will build my church. Peter, I will build my church. And notice Peter doesn't say here, hey guys, actually I'm the foundation stone of the church. That's not what he says, is it? He says, Jesus is the foundation stone. Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the one that glues us together. Friends, can you reflect for a moment why, what ties you together here in this church? What brings you here? You know, we're not tied together by hobbies. We're not like, you know, a gardening club or a knitting club or a, or a craft club or a motorbike club. That's not what ties us together. What ties us together? It's Jesus. Jesus creates strong ties here in this church. Without him, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be together. We're living stones and we're cemented together. We're brought together by Jesus, the cornerstone, because my best friend is your best friend. My saviour is also your saviour. And what that does is that ties us together. Do you realise if you're here today and you're a young Tamil male who follows Jesus, do you realise that you have more in common with someone who is a, an older South Sudanese woman who's a grandmother? You have more in common with that person than with another male from your own culture. You know why that is? Because you both love Jesus. You both follow him. And if you're here today and you're an older white Australian woman, you have more in common with a younger male Tamil who also follows Jesus than someone else from your own culture. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus creates ties that we could never dream of. That's why we're here. We're here because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're living stones cemented together because of him. Now, this image of living stones being built into a spiritual house um, with Jesus as the cornerstone, as I've said, it's the image of the temple. Do you understand what this means? Do you understand that Jesus inhabits us as a community here. Whenever we get together, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, whenever we're together in, not just here on a Sunday, but when we're gathered in our small groups during the week, our growth groups, God is in us together. Truly amazing. God, and I want you to appreciate this. God is in our midst in a way which doesn't happen when we go home. God is here with us in our midst in a way that is more special than when we depart and when we go home. His glory is available to us as a community in a way that's not available to us as individuals. Have you noticed that um, when you stay home from church and you choose to watch it online, do you notice that the experience is so different? Do you notice that? Have you ever sat, it, it's a bit like this, have you ever sat in front of a fireplace and you've enjoyed the glow, you've enjoyed the warmth of sitting before a fireplace and the, and the actual crackle and, the, and seeing the sparks fly in different directions and just feeling the, the warm environment that, that a fire actually gives? How different is it when you turn on one of those videos and put it on your TV that shows a fireplace going? Huh? What's that like? Well, it's so different, isn't it? You don't experience the warmth for a start. You don't hear the crackle in the same way. You don't see the you see sparks fly off the off the, you know, off screen, but you don't get to see where they go. All right? It, it's so different. The experience is not the same. Friends, it's the same when you watch online church. When you stay home 
And it's not actually church, is it? When it's, it's, it's a funny name, online church. It's not really church. But you're, we understand what it means. You're watching church. But you're not experiencing the glow. You're not experiencing the warmth. You're not seeing how people sing praises to God. You're not, you're not seeing how seriously people take the word of God as they drink it down and as the word of God quenches their thirst and they go home satisfied. You're not able to have conversations with people where you experience the warm welcome of the love of Jesus. It's so different, isn't it? Watching online church to experiencing church here. That's why his glory is available to us as a community in a way that is not available to us as individuals. When you come to church, people will have insights into Jesus that you won't have. Um, they'll know Jesus in a way that you don't know him. And you'll experience his glory in a way here that you won't experience it um, if you're just on your own. So can I encourage you that this image of us being the temple, it encourages us not to be private about our relationship with Jesus. It encourages us not to turn up late because we'll miss out on some elements of what we experience in church. It'll encourage us to not rush off home too early afterwards, but to experience the warm glow of the love of Jesus in our community and to stay and talk to other living stones who are here. Living stones talk to living stones. And it'll encourage us to join a small group as well because relationships take time. And we want to experience the warmth and the glow of our community that comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because his glory is available to us in community in a way that isn't available to us as individuals. So this first image is telling us about our place. We are a spiritual house. But the second image that we're going to see here, it gets better actually. Um, this second image is the image of a priest. Have a look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be what? To be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This passage is telling us that you and I are this. Here's the image. It's priests, Old Testament priests, offering sacrifices. Okay, can you see them there? Offering the sacrifice on the altar. Um, you are actually sitting next to a priest. Say hello to the priest sitting next to you. Hello, priest. Now, you're sitting next to a priest. What an honour you have. Wow, to be sitting next to a priest. What a privilege has been placed upon you to be a priest. Now, today, um, the last Sunday in October, is um, a day that we often refer to as Reformation Sunday. And one of the biblical truths in the Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. We're all priests. We all have direct access to God. Um, you know, being a priest isn't something that is just reserved for people in ministry. My job is not to be your priest. Do you know that my prayers don't have special powers above any other prayers? of priests in this church, okay? I love praying for people when, when they have need, but do you know that my prayers don't get any further to God than anyone else's prayers here who love and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we're all priests. What does a priest do? A priest has direct access to God. I have the same access to God that you have to God. And what do priests do? They offer spiritual sacrifices, just like these guys in this picture. And when that happens, God looks down and he beams with delight at the sacrifices 
um, that are made. What this means is that every single person has a priestly ministry to offer to God. Every single one of you has a special service before God that you can make. Um, every single person here has a sacred ministry that is on offer to God. Have you considered your priestly sacrifice? So many of you have. So many of you work tirelessly. Um, so many of you are on the roster week after week after week serving, doing your duty as a priest. You know, we, we talked about the, the uh, international dinner last night and what a great night it was. But do you realize that so much work went into that behind the scenes? People cooking food, people setting up, people packing up afterwards, people serving throughout the night, bringing food out, putting food back in, people behind in the next room washing dishes and cleaning up. Do you, do you realize that? Why? Because people were doing the role as of a priest, serving, doing a, a special ministry, offering up a sacrifice before God. If you're still considering, how can I help in this church? What things can I do to be a priest, to offer my priestly sacrifice? Here are some ideas. Um, we've, we, there's so many opportunities to serve here in this church. There's thing, we, we're still looking for people to help with homework, homework club. We'd still love for people to volunteer for that. Um, we'd love more people to help us run more MOSA events. Um, we need people to help with kids' church, little kids' church. We need people on welcoming. We need people on sound and computer. We need people on morning tea. We need people to make meals for others who are in need. Um, we need people to who ring people who aren't here. There's so many opportunities that you can, you can serve. You have been given a priest's license. You've been ordained to serve as a priest. We have, what, about 80 priests in this church? Wow, that's amazing. And what that means is it's not about me, church, or even you, church, but it's about us, church, us together serving as priests because, look, Jesus Christ spilled his blood to make us priests. And so now it's our turn to follow in our Savior's footsteps and to give, offer him our sacrifice of service. What's our practice? You're a holy priesthood. Each of us has a sacred ministry. That's the second picture and what that teaches us. And... Here's the third picture. What's that a picture of? That's Israel. Where are they? They're at Mount Sinai. That's right. Do you remember what happened at Mount Sinai? When the people, we, we just looked at it um, earlier this year, didn't we? The people of God um, were set free from being slaves in Egypt and they crossed through the Red Sea and on the other side they went to the bottom of this big mountain called Mount Sinai where God spoke to them from out of the fire and the thunder and the lightning and they heard these words from Exodus 19. Listen to these words. God said, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. Does that sound familiar? We just read those words in 1 Peter. It's exactly what Peter says to us. Now, before we get to this third image, I want you to notice the purpose of it. Have you, if you've had an experience of grace, do you realize these descriptions of Israel at Mount Sinai, they're applied to followers of Jesus. Verse 9, a chosen people. In other words, called out of the nations, chosen before the world. 
Isn't that amazing? See, the wonder is not that, you know, God has chosen some and not others. You know what the wonder is? That he chose you. That's amazing. That he would choose you. To be a royal priesthood. To show the world what God is like. We're all priests. We're a holy nation set apart for God's purpose. With God as our ruler. God as our king. And a people belonging to God. In other words, he's brought us. We're his prized possession. We're, we're the, the precious thing that God cannot part with. He holds us tightly as his own. That's who we are. But look at the whole reason for this image in the next, in the next um, part, the, in the second half of the verse. Um, the whole reason for this is that in order that you, verse 9, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. See, that's our purpose, to declare the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his life. It, it's proclaiming. It's something that we actually speak. That's what we do. We speak. It's something that is said. We, we, we tell people about the excellence of his character. We tell people about the glory of his name. He, he has in mind speaking about Jesus, about how you've come to Jesus. Calling out of darkness into the light is what happens when someone becomes a Christian. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about evangelism. Now, why don't we do this more? You ever stop to think of your own heart in that? Why don't I tell more people, declare his praises more than I do? Why, as a church, aren't we doing this more? Why aren't we fulfilling our purpose more? I think one reason could be that sometimes we don't have the right motive. Look at verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but, one, but now you have received mercy. Do you see, this is a verse of wonder. This is a verse of amazement. This is a, a verse that has a huge wow factor. You know the wow factor? The thing that, that makes you go, open your mouth and go, whoa. Whoa. The wow factor. Once we didn't have mercy, but now we have mercy. Wow. I wonder if sometimes we've lost the wonder of receiving the mercy. You know, um, as you know, I'm married to an American, right? And, and she's wondering, what is he going to say next? Okay. I'm so scared. But, you know... Um, my wife is from the US and whenever her parents come to visit us, it's a, it's a wonderful time of being united with family. But one of the things I really enjoy is taking my in-laws to see different parts of Sydney and Australia that they haven't seen before. You know, we've taken them to the Opera House. We've taken them to the Botanical Gardens. We took them down south wants to see live kangaroos and we do all these things and for me they're just normal things of being an Aussie you know they're just things that I experience here there's no wow factor for me but I get to see those things through their eyes and I get to see their reaction to those things and I see them pull out their cameras and I see them hear them say oh we've got to take a picture of this my bible study group would love to see this me and a kangaroo right they they love that kind of thing but i don't pull out my camera and take a picture of me in front of the the opera house you know and put it all on facebook i mean who wants to see that i mean i don't care about that i i live here it's my experience do you see i've lost the wow factor but they have the wow factor and they help me to see the wow factor. And what I'm saying is, I wonder if 
you've lost the wow factor when it comes to Jesus. See, if you have stopped seeing Jesus as wonderful, if you've stopped marveling at the fact that he's called you out of darkness and into his glorious light, if you've lost the joy of that, 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 that he has made you his prized possession, he holds tightly onto you, you belong to him. If you've lost that, you'll never tell people about Jesus. You'll never declare his praises. But if you're someone who keeps meditating, thinking, dwelling, rejoicing in what he did for you, that once you were lost, now you are found, that once you were blind, now you can see that he took your place and died the death that you deserve to die. If you, if you keep rejoicing in, in those things, wow, you won't be quiet about declaring his praises. Church, beloved of God, do you see who you are? Do you see your place? You're a heavenly dwelling. Do you see your practice? Everyone here has a ministry. Do you see your purpose? Declaring his praises. Let's do it. I'll pray. Loving Father, what a, what a joy it is to be your person. What a, what a privilege it is to be called out of darkness and into the light. Oh, Father, help us to keep looking in wonder at what you've done for us so that we might truly be the people of God who declare your praises, the praises of him who called us out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. In Jesus' name, amen.